Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. Our Heavenly Father, you are a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Father, you are the number one counselor that we could ever come to, to find out truth from the Old Testament and New Testament, to learn about you and your character, who you are, why you do what you do, what we need to do to please you, to walk with you, to know you. It's all laid out in your word. It's all laid out in the Old Testament. If the Old Testament's uh, obsolete, then we have no reason to study it. You wouldn't have given it to us, but you have, because it's rich, full of the wonderful character of God and how you deal with your people. So let us today learn about your character, some of the hard things to see about your character sometimes, but also let us learn about the people that we see and how people lived at a time like that, how they made decisions and what they did with them and what the consequences were. So we can learn from them. And as the New Testament says, we can learn from their example. And I'm adding to that, that we don't fall in their ways. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, how often do you seek counsel for something? I look back on scripture as I was thinking this morning. Who are some people that sought counsel or were given counsel? In Moses' case, he didn't seek Jethro's advice, but his father-in-law Jethro came to him and offered advice and said, you can't handle all these people. You need judges people who will stand with you to counsel the people. Moses saw that was a good idea, and he did it, and it was a good idea, delegating authority. And then I thought of Nathan. David wasn't looking for any counsel, but, David went to hi- but Nathan went to him in 2 Samuel 12 and confronted him with the idea of the sin that he had committed with Bathsheba and killing Uriah. David listened to that counsel. New Testament. Paul's going out into the uncircumcised Gentiles. And there's disagreement. Some of the Jews say the Gentiles need to be circumcised to be part of the Jewish clan. And Paul's saying, no, they don't. So they go up to the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. And they seek counsel as to what they should do. Isn't it wise to (laughs) seek counsel? The um, uh, 38, 36 years ago, my, I had a newborn son, and my, uh, I, my church was 30 minutes away. It was tough to drive there with a newborn child. So I said, um, I guess I was talking to my mom one day, and she said, my mom, who never went to church, said, why don't you try that little Baptist church on the corner, which is on the corner where you turn in to go to our house, and well, it was this church. And I've been a member for 36 years ever since then. But so my mother, who didn't go to church, recommended a good, solid church to me, which is interesting. So you can get counsel from anywhere. More appropriately, this week, I came off of a week with the grandchildren. It was great. We had a wonderful time. But when you come off of a week with the grandchildren, how do you feel? Tired. <laughs> We were actually doing really good. I mean, we, we took late afternoon Saturday and relaxed and then went to an event Saturday night, and we were really doing good. But Sunday morning, I knew that in front of me were five teachings this week, which means five studies and preps, plus a whole day's worth of administrative stuff I had to do, plus, 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 you know, a couple of evening events and daytime events. and <sighs> So this tomorrow... My daughter-in-law is having some surgery. I ask you to pray for her because she's got to have a polyp removed from her ovary. They just determined, like I think last Friday, that it was going to be this Friday. And so I know I want to be there in Norfolk with her. And I know I should be in Norfolk with her, but I don't want to go because <laughs> I'm tired. You know. So, so Monday night, we're with some friends, and I said, ah, you know, I told, asked her to pray, and she said, are you going up? And I said, Well, I want to go, and I should go, but I don't want to go. She said, you need to go. I said, I know. She said, no, 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 you need to go. And I knew that. 
I just need a day or two to get refreshed so I could have the oomph to go. But the point is, she gave me counsel. This girl never gives me counsel. But just she gave me words of wisdom. And she told me what I knew, but it was good to hear it from somebody. That's how important counsel is. What about bad counsel? You know, we tend to, in this society, if we want to do something, we want to have an abortion, we want to get a divorce, we want to do whatever, because we're in a tough situation, whatever the situation is, when we go for counsel, who do we go to? People that will tell us what we want to hear. That's what we tend to do. Because we've already made up our minds that we want to do it, usually. And we just need somebody to say, it's okay, you can do it. Now, if my friend Monday night had said, oh, you're tired, I understand, it's okay, you know, she'll understand. That's not what I need to hear. I needed to hear the truth, not just somebody patting me on the back. That's what we need to seek when we seek counsel. We're going to study today. I came into this today wanting to talk to you about civil war because if anybody ever tells you that the Old Testament is not applicable to today, <laughs> just look at the civil war that's happened there and what's happening in our country. But that's not what these chapters are all about. It's all about counsel, the kind of counsel that we seek and that we get. So keep that in mind, and we'll talk about some of those verses. I noticed in, in our homework that we had some council verses, and I've picked up some other ones, too, that hopefully we'll have time to talk about. But for now, we're going to begin. We want to focus today on the consequences of bad counsel, because unfortunately, that's what today is about. It's not the consequences of good counsel. It's the consequences we see of people who sought or were given bad counsel. So we first have 1 Kings 12, and then we have 1 Kings 13 that we're going to be discussing. So let's begin right now with 1 Kings chapter 12. I wanted to do a PowerPoint today because there are so many places we need to see in as we go through this, and I wanted you to be able to see them on a map. It begins 1 Kings 12, 1. Then Rehoboam, who was Rehoboam? Solomon's son. Solomon's son, went to Shechem. For all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. Why was he being made king? Solomon had died. Solomon had died. Now we had as a cross-reference 1 Chronicles 10. But 1 Chronicles 10 is almost verbatim 1 Kings 12, at least up to chapter 19, or verse 19. So we're not going to do any cross-referencing in 1 Chronicles 10, but I hope you read it because it's good just to have a reminder of that. Uh, but I want, you, I want to ask you, Shechem, why did he go to Shechem to be crowned king? I mean, maybe these are things you don't even think about and don't even care about, but for me, I thought, why Shechem? Where was Solomon crowned king? You remember? I'm not the exact location, but the city. Hmm? Gibeon? Nope. He went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, but he was crowned king in Jerusalem. So why would, why would Rehoboam not be crowned king in Jerusalem? What? Shechem hasn't been mentioned since the time of Judges in, in Scripture. And here we are. We've gone through three kings, the rest of the Judges and three kings, and it's never been mentioned. They don't, they, nobody's going there. Let's see where it is. This map is very important. This was in your homework. Uh, I, I'll move here in a minute so you can both see. But Shechem is right here. Bethel is here, Jerusalem here, Bethlehem here to give you an idea. Uh, but Shechem is up here. Today it's known as Nablus. Uh, you hear about that a lot because it's a West Bank city that a lot of people, uh, a lot of the terrorists live in is the city of Nablus. Matter of fact, the two most terroristic Cities in the West Bank are Nablus, which is Shechem, and Hebron down here. So Shechem is up here. Jerusalem is here. Jerusalem is in the territory of whom? Benjamin. Benjamin. See, I think a lot of people think Jerusalem's in the territory of Judah because that's where the king lived and that's where the tribe of Judah is where the king would come from. But it's not. Jerusalem's in the tribe of Benjamin. Then Judah is just down here a little bit further south with Simeon kind of in the middle of that. So you have uh, Shechem up here. 
So I got to thinking Shech- or Shechem or Nablus. It's uh, also, if you've read about scripture in Deuteronomy 28, well, that's not, not true. It wasn't in Deuteronomy 28. Uh, later on, when they went into the promised land, the priest stood on Mount Gebel and Mount Gerizim, and they recited the law to the people. And they said, basically, who are you going to serve? These are the rules of God. Are you going to obey them or not? The guys that stood on the good side and said, these are the blessings God promises, they stood on Mount Gerizim, up on a hill. The priests who spoke about the consequences of sin spoke on Mount Ebal. The highway goes right in today. Back then, even, too, the highway goes right between these two hills. And guess what city is right next to it? Shechem or Nablus. So it's an important area. I'd love to go there, but it's a little too far into the West Bank for us to go. Right, right. She said it's first mentioned in Genesis 12, 12, 6, where Abraham passed through and where the Canaanites were. And that's true because Shechem is one of the places. They had an old ancient road that passed through Shechem. It's the same road, Highway 60, that they have now that goes from Jerusalem all the way up to the north. So actually, Abraham would have come in through Dan in the north that we'll see in just a minute, and he would have walked the country and come down through Shechem. This is before we had the problem with the Samaritans and the, and the Jews. So he would have come right through the territory and come through Shechem. But why go there to be crowned king? Because, a little history here, we're going to see today the division of the nation after Solomon, Solomon's son. But did you know the nation was divided under Saul's son? See, the first king in Israel was Saul, second king David, third king Solomon. Under King Saul, uh, under king Saul when he died, his son Ishbosheth took control of the throne for a couple of years. And when he did, they controlled the northern part of Israel. And David, the southern. David, remember, lived and reigned in Hebron for seven years. So the nation had been divided def- before, but unofficially. And then we had David who united everything, and Solomon united everything. Now it's going to be divided again. So Shechem was in the northern part back then, in the days when it was originally divided. Hmm, why go up there? Why go up there when the capital is Jerusalem, his father was crowned in Jerusalem? Well, I think he knew what was coming. I think he went up there. This is me. I don't know from scripture, but my only conjecture is to leave the capital and go somewhere else, he was perhaps trying to unite the country where you bring the people that might not agree with you to you. And also remember, uh, well, we're going to see it. I guess you saw it last week. Who's his main nemesis? Who's going to come up against him? Jeroboam. Where was Jeroboam from? Samaria. Do you know where Shechem is in? Samaria. So he might have been going up there to be crowned king because he was trying to unite the people that supported Jeroboam with his people. I mean, that's the only reason I can see because otherwise there is no precedent for being crowned king in Samaria. So that's why it's kind of fun to look deeper sometimes and get those in insights into the fact that Rehoboam understood there was some division going on. And he probably was trying to mend it. Or at least we hope that he, that he was. Now in verse 2 it says, Now when Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, heard of it, he was living in Egypt. For he was yet in Egypt, where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. You read about that last week. Uh, 1 Kings 11.26 tells us he was an Ephraimite, which is where Shechem is. Then they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam. Who came to speak to Rehoboam? Jeroboam Jeroboam and all the assembly. So the people were united as they come to Rehoboam and make their request. What was their request in verse 4? Make our yoke easier. Your father made our yoke hard. Well, I can imagine building the house and the temple and uh, all of the chariot cities and all that he did, he made their yoke hard. And they said very simply, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke and we will serve you. 
For us, it's kind of like, reduce our taxes and we'll stand with you. You know, that kind of a thing. Because it's a burden on people. Maybe that's a little too simplistic. But they came with a very legitimate concern. And so Rehoboam did a very wise thing. He told them why. Okay, give me three days and then return. I I don't know if I've ever shared with you before, but I believe three days is significant. Uh, Whenever anything happens to me and I'm struggling or I'm sad or I'm depressed because something happened or whatever, I just give it three days. Matter of fact, not long ago, I told my husband, I need three days. Just, you know, understand, I'm, I'm frustrated about a situation. Just give me three days. Three days were over and I was fine. Why is three days significant? Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days. Jesus was in the grave for three days. Um, there was one other one in scripture that was for three days. Uh, but I found that to be significant and true. So I thought giving... Requesting three days was really wise. He's got time to think about it, to seek counsel, to make a wise decision. (laughs) Who did he seek counsel from first in verses 6 and 7? Okay, the elders who had served his father. What did they suggest? What was their counsel? Do it. Do what the people requested. And they said, if you will be a servant to this people today, in verse 7, and will serve them and grant them their petition and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. That is really wise counsel. Then who did he go to for counsel? <laughs> the young men. Uh, uh, you know, I just imagine today going to seek the counsel of um, Tom Osborne, you know, an elder statesman, or going to seek the advice of a millennial. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't, but can you see the difference in advice (coughs) that we would get? Because the millennials have a whole different mindset than the elder statesmen do. Just totally different than us. Uh, We're seeing that in our culture. Now, again, I'm not saying don't talk to millennials because they have some very wise insights that we need to understand. But are you you insulted back there, you young millennials? You're not quite millennials. I'm not a millennial. Are you? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, millennials have been through a lot. I mean, we have given them a lot, and now they're, they're opening up to new ideas different from ours. It's kind of like they want different things than what their parents have. That's not bad, but it is bad when they move to socialism or some other things that are bad for our country. Uh, but so, you know, the, the point I'm making is when you seek counsel, you want to make sure that your counsel is wise counsel, not the counsel that would just tell you what you want to hear. And is this what he wanted to hear? I don't know, but he followed their advice. Uh, their advice to him was when he saw it, verse 8, he, he um, forsook the adv- counsel of the elders, as it said, and he consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. And in verse 10, what counsel did they give? Make it harder. Make it harder. Yeah, thus you shall say to the people who spoke to you, your father made you yoke heavy, Now you make it lighter for us, but you shall speak to them and saying, my little finger is thicker than my father's loins. That sounds like an awfully strange statement. (laughs) Uh, You know, I have my opinions of what I think that means, but uh, most scholars will tell you it simply means that my power will be greater than that of my father's. Mm -hmm. And he's using a um, very personal example to say that. So he's saying, I'm going to be stronger. It's going to be tougher under me. That's the counsel he got. What counsel did you listen to? The counsel of the young man. We don't know why. Is that what he wanted all along? But we do know that that's the counsel he took. Let's read that. Let's read those next verses. Uh, In verse 11, it says, Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions much tougher than what they even asked for. Then Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, and he told them what was going to happen. Um, and, uh, it's, and the consequences, it says in verse 15, the king, so the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of events from the Lord. 
that he might establish his word, which the Lord spoke through Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. We read about that. You read about it last week in 1 Kings 11. It was a turn of events from the Lord. As Anne said, his heart was hardened to do what needed to be done because of God's prophesying of the division of the nations. We saw that with Pharaoh, how his heart was hardened sometimes. What does that have to do with us having a free will and free choice of the decisions we make if God is going to be the one to direct the events? Uh, very, very probable from what we see about Rehoboam that he was going to follow in his father's footsteps and keep it hard for the people is what she said. The point here is God had said what was going to happen. He knew in advance what was going to happen. He prepared these circumstances so that they happened exactly as he said they would. But I believe that, a as Bonnie said, his heart was away from God anyway at this point. We're going to see that next week when we study. His heart was away from God, and he was going to do whatever he wanted to do anyway. God just used that, what he knew was going to happen, to facilitate the prophecy. Yeah, yeah, well, you're right. Jeroboam went with them. Jeroboam stood with them. So let's move on with that in mind. In verse 16, it says, When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, then the people answered the king and said, What portion do we have with David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Remember, these are the people. He's up in Shechem. He's up in Samaria. These are the people that followed Saul and who followed Ishbosheth, his Saul's son. And they say, what inheritance do we have in Jesse? There's already a rift there. I mean, this is so much like the Democrats and the Republicans. There's just a rift there already. And all they need is an excuse to stand on that rift. And so then they called in verse 16 and said what? To your tents, O Israel. What does that mean? <laughs> Let's go get ready to fight. We are going to divide. The civil war is going to start. Now look after your own house, David. Ooh, that was, yeah, <laughs> that was almost a, a slander to them. So Israel were departed to their tents. It was time for civil war. We're, we're seeing that. We're right in the middle of that today. We have never seen such civil war in America since the civil war as we're seeing today. Why is that? This time, it, well, back then it was a difference in ideology, slavery or no slavery. Now it's a difference of a, a progressive socialistic agenda versus a conservative a capitalistic agenda. Total polar opposites. It used to be that uh, you know, our leaders could come together in the middle even though they had their sides. Uh, verse 17 now says, But as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who, who was over forced labor, and what did they do to him? They stoned him to death. Stoned him to death. Now, I, I went back to see where we last saw, or where we saw him before. He was David's leader over forced labor. So he was the one who was over the people under David, and then Solomon, and now <laughs> going to start under Rehoboam. Why would you send <laughs> the person that's over forced labor, when the people say they don't want to be under forced labor, to talk to the people, or to stand with the people, or to represent you. Not a wise decision. Because they did what you would expect. They killed him. This is a, this is a war, folks. They're seeing this as the beginning of war, so they killed him. So King Rehoboam made haste to mount his chariot and flee to Jerusalem. See, he's leaving Shechem. He's coming down to Jerusalem. That's his safe haven. He didn't have a safe haven in Shechem. Verse 19, so Israel had been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Well, remember, to this day that this is written. And this is written at the time of the exile, many hundreds of years later. So what happens in verse 20? What do the people in Judah do? They made Jeroboam king. Jeroboam king, I'm sorry. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly, I'm sorry, and made him king over all Israel. None but the tribe of Judah followed the house of David. 
Now we're going to see as we go along that, that that expounds from the house of Judah to also Benjamin. Uh, and Simeon, poor Simeon, is, has a territory right here, kind of in the middle of Judah. And so eventually it kind of gets usurped into, Jer- into Judah. You don't really see much about it as an independent tribe. So the southern kingdom is going to be down here. Let's look at a map as a matter of fact. Here we have a map of the division of the 12 tribes originally. And you see that um, Shechem is between, or, or is a, there's Shechem. Shechem, it says here, is part of Manasseh. Well, that's interesting because the Bible says it's part of Ephraim, so this isn't the right map, a good map. But uh, what you see is the division right here of the 12 tribes, or a close idea of the division. You see Jer- Jerusalem is part of Benjamin right there, Bethlehem part of Judah. And then you see the division, what will happen when the nation divides. This, I guess if you go back here, you get a better picture of the uh, size. So this bottom part is going to be Judah. And much more territory in the north is going to be Israel. When you look at this, it makes it look like Judah's a huge place, and it really was, but from Beersheba, it's not listed on here, um, but, oh, there it is, Beersheba. From Beersheba south, this is all desert, all solid desert. So really, most of their usable territory would come down to maybe about here. So they had territory, but they didn't have usable territory in that part of the country, in that part of the world. So let's go back now to this map because we're going to look at it again in a few minutes. All right, so now we see verse 21. There's a plan. Rehoboam has a plan. Israel has gone to their tents, so what does that mean Rehoboam's going to have to do? Yep, he's going to have to get ready to fight. Verse 21 of 1 Kings 12. Now when Rehoboam had come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. How many people? 180,000. You know, it just breaks my heart to think of our civil war and all of our sons and daughters who died from both sides. And here we're looking at the same thing happening to Israel. They were warriors. They went out to fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But what happened? Yeah, God came through a prophet, a man of God, it says. He's called a prophet in Second Chronicles 12, 5. Shemaiah. And he, sa- and he spoke to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of David, and said, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin and to the rest of the people. There we see the house of Judah and the house of Benjamin being brought in together as this southern tribe, as the southern part of the nation. Verse 24, the Lord, thus says the Lord, you must do what? not go up and fight against your relatives, the sons of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing has come from me. Did, uh, well, uh, Rehoboam didn't really know, maybe, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, whose counsel he was listening to, which one was from God and which one wasn't. But this is clearly from God, because what did he do? It says he listened. They listened to the word of the Lord, and returned and went their way according to the word of the Lord. Now we're seeing some wisdom. We're seeing them act in a, in a wise way. We see, so we, even though there's consequences, and the consequences to bad counsel here is a civil war, we're going to see Rehoboam actually do some good things. Rehoboam, I can never spell that right. Where are you, Rehoboam? Rehoboam, B-O-A-M. I think that's close enough. And then here you have Jeroboam. And uh, by the way, I'm terrible at pronouncing these names, so I'm sure that they're pronounced differently in the Hebrew. But this is how I call them. Let's stop for a minute. Now that we see that Rehoboam made a wise decision, he listened to the counsel of God and didn't go to war, let's turn to the companion passage in Second Chronicles 11. Because there's a lot in this companion passage that we see that isn't in 1 Kings. And some of it might not seem to have any value, but I think we get a good feeling of 
Rehoboam right now at this time. It's going to change, but at this time, at this point. In verse 2 Chronicles 11, 5, it said, Rehoboam lived in Jerusalem and he built cities for defense in Judah. That was a wise decision to make. And then it goes on and it lists the cities. He built Bethlehem. And you don't see most of them on the map. Um, Tekoa is right just south of Bethlehem. All these places, all the way down to Hebron, Hebron's here. All these places he built up and he fortified because these are the main cities in Judah, the main places in Judah before you get into the Negev, the wilderness. So he built all of them up. In verse 11, what else did he do? Strengthened fortresses and... Yep, put officers in them and supplies that they would need. What's the purpose of doing all of this? Yeah, to be protected from an attack that might come. Because he knows they've gone off to their tents. So even though he's not to go to war, he needs to defend himself. We see that in Israel today. Israel does not go to war against anyone. They have not gone to war against anyone. They have defended themselves, however. And everything they're doing, they're doing for the purpose of defense. Because they must protect themselves and their land, or they will be destroyed. And they know that. Verse 12, also what else did they put in there? Shields and spears in every city and strengthened them greatly. And not only that, but what people group came forward? In verse 13, the priests and the Levites, who were where? In all of Israel. They're going to see, and as we are pretty soon, what Jeroboam's going to do with the priests or about the priests. So it indicates that they came from all of Israel and they stood with him from all the districts. For the Levites left their pasture lands and their property and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had, execu has, had excluded them from serving as priests to the Lord. So they came to Jerusalem. They gave up everything. Instead of being in a situation where they could not worship freely and serve freely, they left their homes, their farmlands, their cities, and they came to Judah where they could do what God has called them to do. Are you willing to leave an evil environment, a wrong environment, a, a, an environment of poor counsel, an environment where you can't use your gifts that God has given you? Are you willing to leave that in order to go to a place where you can serve and do what God's called you to do? Now, I don't know what that would look like with you, but some of you, it might, it might be what God's talking to you about. You know, I know that there are people who, when they, uh, who are involved in drugs or alcohol or what it may be gambling, whatever it is, that when they come to the Lord, they know they need to stop those relationships, stop those friendships, because it will draw them right back into that kind of a life. And they give those up in order to be able to go and lo live with and serve with other people who want to serve the Lord. But that's, that's a lot to ask people to give up. Hmm. Does that look like us? <laughs> I mean, when we start off on the right foot and we look like we're going in God's direction, and then all of a sudden we turn and go in a different direction? Or the opposite. We start off looking like we might make the right decisions, and then we go to the wrong. Why do we do that? Because we're sinners, and we live in an evil world, and we're tempted. And, you know, who's kidding who? When we first come to know the Lord, we're pretty naive, you, generally. We don't really know a lot. Uh, we, we're going to get to this in the next chapter, but we might listen to bad counsel in uh, leaders. So, you know, it's easy to fall because that's where we came from. That's what we know. That's what we're comfortable with. It's easy to go in that direction. It takes a disciplined person, a follower of Jesus Christ. In our homework, I saw that we, we read um, Luke 14, a fabulous passage on how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And how do you be a disciple of Jesus Christ? You hate your father and your mother and your sons and your daughters. In other words, you love them less than you love God. You give up everything of yourself to follow Jesus, and that includes giving up all your assets and resources to follow Jesus. It's not easy. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. 
That's it, it is. He, he, so he followed bad counsel, but then listened to the Lord. So we can change. We can change and go in the right direction, even though we've been going in the wrong direction. It's our decision. Now we're going to see in the next chapter that he goes back in the wrong direction. So he doesn't listen to the Lord for long, but right now he's listening to the Lord. Maybe he had an epiphany when he heard that he wasn't supposed to go to war and that God had spoken to him, and so that changed him. And he clearly listened to the Lord there. That goes on to tell us also in, um, as we look at uh, verse 16 of 2 Chronicles 11, those from all the tribes of Israel who set their, what? Hearts on seeking the Lord God of Israel did what? Followed the Levites to Jerusalem. So the people who loved the Lord knew that Rehoboam was to be the king, knew that that's where they needed to be following him, and they left their environment to follow him. So the Levites left and the godly people left. Who's left in the northern kingdom? Yeah, the ungodly people. You know, they, they say, uh, my kids, we felt important to send our kids to Christian schools. Uh, but as some people always point out, if we take all of our kids out of the public schools and put them in Christian schools, then where is there going to be any good people, you know, Christian people in the Christian school, in the public schools? So, you know, you've got a point there. The northern kingdom is now left with ungodly people. We're going to see the results of that in a little while. But on the other hand, that gives a foundation for the southern kingdom which is the kingdom lineage of the Messiah, to follow God because they're godly people. They won't, but it gives them the opportunity to. That is wonderful because what she's saying is that it's believed, we don't know for sure, but it's believed that Jeremiah wrote kings to the people who were in exile so that they would never forget their history. Because Jeremiah stayed in Jerusalem when uh, the rest of Israel was going into exile. We'll read about that later. But in 586, fi 605 to 586 B.C., Ezra, who was a scribe who was in exile, who came back to Jerusalem and brought 50,000 people back with him. You can read about it in the book of Ezra. But he probably wrote chronicles to remind the people who were coming back that this is our heritage, this is our history. And what's our culture doing? What's our educational system doing? They're rewriting our history. They're wiping out the history. In some countries, they're taking out the Holocaust because it might offend people to, to hear about what happened in the Holocaust. We are taking out our history of our founding fathers in a lot of our history books so that our kids don't really know our foundational history. Certainly don't know a lot of our Christian foundational history. We must know the past so we can learn and not make those mistakes in the future. Well, Rehoboam then, um, <clears throat> first he followed bad counsel, then he listened to the Lord. Let's keep going on. In verse 11, it says, They strengthened, the people strengthened the kingdom of Judah and supported Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, for how long? Three years. And then we have the story of Rehoboam getting married and the names of his wives and the names of his children and the name and the, his uh, uh, how many sons and daughters he had, which was 25 sons and 60 daughters. Verse 22, it says, Rehoboam appointed Abijah, the son of Micah, as head and leader among his brothers, for he intended him to be king. king. And we'll read about that as we continue on. Verse 23, what does that tell us about Rehoboam? He acted wisely. He acted wisely. Now that's amazing because we certainly haven't seen that Outside of listening to God there, we didn't see that before. But now, the civil war has started. He's in a different environment. The people have turned away from him. At least part of the people have turned away from him. And now he's acting wisely. And he distributed some of his sons throughout all the territories of Judah and Benjamin to all the fortified cities, and he gave them food in abundance, and he sought many wives for them. That wasn't um, wise, but <laughs> the fact is he acted wisely. He took his bad counsel that he gave, he learned from it, and he acted wisely. That's going to change, but for now, that's where he is. You know, we could ask ourselves, uh, when we learn from our mistakes, do we stay on the right path? Or do we soon get complacent and turn back around? I'm just saying, he's making a fat calf. You know? He's, he's making a what? He's keeping a fat calf. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good point. He's keeping them fat and happy. And that's what most people want. You know, it's all about the economy, stupid, is what the, the um, 
mantra was for President Clinton's campaign in the early 90s, because if you keep the people happy, if you keep them wealthy or comfortable, then they're going to be happy, and then they won't cause a stink. Well, let's go see about Jeroboam now, what he did. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim. And that makes sense. The Shechem is where pretty much where um, his legacy is, where he's from and where the people have supported him. And he lived there, and he went out from there, and he built what? Penuel. Do you know where Penuel is? Penuel? Well, that's a wonderful story because Penuel is right here. It's east of the Jordan. I'm going to come over here now. It's on the east side of the Jordan River. It's right on the Jabbok River. Jabbok comes into the Jordan River here. But you see Shechem is here, and he goes over here, and he builds Penuel. In the case or course of the division of the tribes of Israel, whose land is that? Let's backtrack a little bit. Okay. Here's the Jabbok River. Penuel is north of it. It's Sukkoth now. So it's the tribe of Manasseh. So it's an Israeli tribe. They live over there. So he goes, but why build a city here? Why not build a city up here, further north in his territory? Because he's trying to secure this side of the Jordan and this side of the Jordan. So he builds two important cities to do that, to fortify those areas. Does anybody know or remember what happened on the Jabbok River? Well, this is kind of ironic because it is on the Jabbok River that Jacob was first called Israel. He is, Jacob is coming home with all of his wives and his goods, and he's going to meet his brother Esau. Before he does, he stops at the Jabbok River and has a dream, and he wrestled with God. It is here where God changed his name to Israel. So this is the area right there. Do you think Jeroboam knows that? Yep. Probably. And he goes over there, and he builds and fortifies that area where that important event happened. Verse 26, Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David. Is that a wise thought? Does that make sense that he would think that? What does that tell you about him with just even having that thought? Fearful. Fearful. Absolutely afraid of what might happen. The people might turn for him. What else? Christine, you kind of went... He's not very confident. Yeah, no confidence at all. He doesn't really have the hearts of the people. Or at least he doesn't think he does because he does have no confidence. What will fear cause us to do, by the way? Control. Control. That's what we're seeing right now in this Kavanaugh situation. Bring in fear. Bring in doubt so that you can control the people's minds and get them to think like you want them to. That's what we're seeing. That's what's going on here. See a little greed maybe, a little power, a little jealousy? He might lose this kingdom that he now has. God promised him it's this kingdom. Why should he be worried about losing it? What does that tell you about Jeroboam and his relationship with God? He doesn't really have one. At least we don't see one. Because God has said, I'm going to give you this kingdom, and I'm going to build your house. If. You, and he goes on here. He, it, well, God says, if you will follow me, if you will do what I've told you to do. He knows it. He, why did Solomon fall? Because he disobeyed God. So how is Jeroboam going to fall? If he disobeys God. How are you and I going to fall? If we disobey God. Verse 27, now we really see where his heart is. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jeroboam, then, so he sees the if-then situation. Here's the scenario. Wow, if they go up to Jerusalem at the three feasts like they're supposed to, then the heart of the people will return to their Lord. Because who's kidding who? Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. I mean, no question about it. And it's got a special place in people's hearts. So if they go up there, then the people will, um, let's see, let me get back to it. The heart of the people, verse 27, will turn, return to the Lord, even to the king, Rehoboam, and then they're going to do what to me? Kill me. Kill me. 
and return to Rehoboam. So he's afraid of losing his kingdom. He's afraid of losing his life. He's just, fear has overtaken him. What's the opposite of faith? Fear. You let fear come into your life and you will not be able to see God. You won't be able to look towards him. You're just going to be able to conjure up all these what ifs. By the way, I think fear has a lot to do with anxiety. If you struggle from anxiety, it's because of fear of what might happen. Why are we afraid? Why do we spend time being afraid of what might happen instead of taking our trust and faith to the Lord God who can control what happens? But he didn't. It says in verse 28, So the cons king consulted and made two golden calves. Who does that sound like? So let's talk about Jeroboam for a minute first. Jer Jeroboam had a bad attitude or wrong attitude. We see in verse uh, 27. And now he's going to have bad actions that follow that attitude. And the first bad action is to make the two golden calves just like Mo Aaron did. Uh, you know, I kind of thought, why would he do that? Did you wonder why he would do that? Of all things, why that? And it, I, it, we, again, we don't know, but I like, to, I like to think through things. Of all the things you could build, I mean, why don't you build a, a snake or a, a fly or something, but why two golden calves? Well, what did Aaron go on to become? The high priest. The, high priest. the, the one who led the lineage of all the high priests after he built the two golden calves. So maybe Jeroboam, in his illogical thinking, thought, well, Aaron did it, and he was the head of the high priest, so it must have really been okay. I mean, we don't know, or maybe he just didn't care about these idols. Because what, is the, what are the first two commandments that God gave? I have no other gods before me. And thou will, I am the Lord thy God, you shall have no other gods before me. And the second one is, you shall not build yourself graven images. Mm -hmm. He should have known that. But his first bad action was to build the golden calves. And he said to them, it is too much for you to the people. It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up for the land of Egypt. And then he set one in Bethel and one in Dan. Why Bethel? Why Dan? The southern and the northern. Now, Bethel wasn't on this map. It's on the smaller one that we, I didn't put up here. Bethel is right here. It's about 30 miles north of Jerusalem. It is the southernmost city in the northern kingdom. Dan, way up there. Do you see it right up above here? Dan, it is the northernmost city in Israel. So he puts them in the furthest north and the furthest south, so that anybody in the north would go to Dan and anybody in the south would go to Bethel and they wouldn't have to go to Jerusalem. Really brilliant thinking. I mean, it was a, it was a smart move for wrong thinking. So let's look. And he said, um, and then he did what? Uh, verse 30, let me say, read that. Now this thing became a what? Sin. Sin. For the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. Sin, of course it is. It goes against the first two commandments. And what else did he do in verse 31? He made on the high okay, he made houses in the high places, and he did what? He made, priests from the people. he made priests from the people. Remember, the priests all left. They went up to Jerusalem. So he has no priests left, but he has to have somebody to offer these sacrifices, so he picks them. Okay, you're going to be a priest, and you're going to be a priest, and you're going to be a priest, and it doesn't matter if they have a lineage or not. But then he's not following God anyway, is he? And what's the final thing he did in verse 32? Institutes a feast. Okay, yeah. Remember, there's three feast times you're supposed to go up to Jerusalem. Spring, Passover, uh, 50 days later, Pentecost, and the fall, the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. So he institutes a feast on the eighth month because there's no feast in Jerusalem on the eighth month. So, and the big fall feast is in the ninth month, so we're going to do it the month before the big fall feast. We're going to kind of uh, usurp their... Uh, their, their authority or more importantly um, get everybody's attention and excitement beforehand before everything happens so that's what he's going to do is this right? No. not at all Now I want to show you here a couple pictures when you go to Dan now Bethel doesn't have anything really to see so we can't go to Bethel and see 
any ruins there of the altar or the tabernacle. But when you go to the city of Dan, when you walk into the area where the, the um, altar was, and this is the altar right here, it's obviously not a, this, the original one, it's the original place, but it's a different altar here. It gives us the idea of what may have been there. But here is the first thing you see. And what do you see? You see people bowing down and worshiping. And there's the calf. Well, that's a calf being sacrificed with the blood coming out. And then you have the, the priests sacrificing. It, and it quotes here from, uh, uh, or, and the same thing we just read, Jeroboam entertained a feast or instituted a feast. So it quotes from 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 32. So you see that right here. Then, oops, get rid of the pointer. Then this is a close-up of the actual site. This is the site where the golden calf was in Dan, the ruins of the site. Here you see it from a little further away. So you get the idea, this is a pretty big sacrificial area for that time. And you've got steps over there on the right so people can watch what's going on. Here you have, I'm teaching this passage here, right there in the place where it happened. And then you can kind of see the background. This is a forest now up in, in the northern part of Israel. But boy, the ruins up here are great. It's a trek to get up here. But you see the walls of this city that you don't see any place else in Israel because they're so unique. But here we are there, and then here's, here I am again here. What you can't see very well, but over on the right, that's our guide. Guides don't usually sit with us when we have our teaching because they hear it all. They know all this stuff. They give us the history, and then I read from the Bible because usually it's 100% right, but they don't expound, and it's not really the Bible. They just tell it, so we read it. But he sat with us, several of our teachings, and he's Jewish. So this was really fun to have him. Of course, this is Old Testament, but it's all appropriate. Sun's certainly sitting on me wrong right there. Uh, uh, this, on this particular day, it was really neat because it sprinkled all the way up until we got here, until I got to that spot and everybody sat down and the rain stopped. So it was great to be able to teach. Now, just on the... <laughs> <laughs> this is Susan's picture. <laughs> Pointing out the lizard over there. The reason I put this in, this is the northern border of Israel right here. That is Lebanon. Behind those bushes, from those bushes on, is Lebanon. As a matter of fact, there's bunkers up here from modern day wars. And when Suze went into the bunker one time, her phone came up and said, welcome to Lebanon. <laughs> so this is the northern border of Israel. Uh, when you go just a little bit further to the right here, as you're walking down, it's probably about three or four blocks, you, uh, did I not put it up? Oh, I guess I didn't. Um, but there's the, a gate, the gate coming into Dan, which is thought to be, we don't know, probably the gate that Abraham walked through to come into the promised land. Mm -hmm. And then he walked down that highway, I told you, that take, goes you all the way to Jerusalem. So this is a significant city. This is where Jeroboam put one of the golden calves so that people wouldn't go south. They'd come up here and worship, and they did. Now you look at um, verse 33 says, Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart, and he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. And one of the passages we looked up in our scripture, and I want to take you there now, is Deuteronomy 13, looked up in our homework, because it's really appropriate to what we're seeing here. At least for the people. In, first, in Deuteronomy 13, starting with verse 6, it says, If your brother, your mother's son, or your son or daughter, or wife you cherish, or your friend who is your own soul, entice you secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, whom neither of you, neither you nor your fathers have known, of the gods of the people who are all around you, near you and far from you, verse 8, you shall not yield to him or listen to him, and your eyes shall not take pity on him, nor shall you spare or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. Verse 10, Deuteronomy 13. So you shall stone him to death, 
because he has sought to seduce you from the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Mm-hmm. Remember in the wilderness when, um, who, who can't think of his name, Korah, Korah, I think, rebelled against um, Israel, rebelled against Moses. God sent the, it, the Levites to destroy all those who rebelled because we cannot have rebellion in our midst against God. That's what this passage says. It says we're to kill them if they try and lead us astray. Now we're in a different situation, different time period, different rules, different laws. But what does that tell us our responsibility is when we see people trying to lead us astray? Even leaders, even religious leaders. Okay, flee from them. Correct them if you have that opportunity. In our case, if they're re- political leaders, we can talk to them, we can write them letters, but we have a voice as to whether they're in leadership or not. We can vote, and that's coming up pretty soon. Uh, next week or so, I'll have a, a list of people I'm going to vote for that I'll share with you if you want it, but the point is that's our opportunity. If we have religious leaders who are not walking with the Lord, walking against the Lord, we have the opportunity to vote them out. But what about religious leaders who are pastors? Don't go to their church. No. What? Don't go to their church. Find another church. All right. Yeah. Get to another church. Yeah. Flee from an environment like that. If you have the opportunity, confront in righteousness. But don't ever go directly one on one to the pastor. I mean, at the Bible, Matthew 18 says you're supposed to go one on one if there's sin. Or if that doesn't work, take two or more with you. But I would recommend if you were going to go to a situation of a difference in biblical integrity, that you take someone else with you that can stand with you in talking to your pastor, not confronting them, you said this, <laughs> but saying, you know, this is what I see about scripture. Mm-hmm. Could you explain to me? We have a, a couple who've traveled with us that um, had that problem in the church. The church was not teaching the Bible correctly. And so they prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And a lot of people were really upset, and they tried not to get involved in the gossip. They went to the pastor of the church, the husband and the wife did, and very nicely asked them about what the church was teaching and showed them the scriptures that said, well, this is what the Bible says. And the pastor, I don't know exactly how he responded, but clearly what he said is, we're not going to change. We're doing everything right, and we don't agree with you. So after they did what they felt they needed to do, they told the pastor at that time, um, you know, we'll get back to you on this. And they did, and they said, we're, we just want you to know we're going to be leaving the church. What happened? Oh, man. Boop, 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 boop. This couple was the talk of the church. Mm-hmm. Now it's turned out that most of the church has left. Mm-hmm. But because they were one of the first ones, this was the talk of the church. Oh, did you know that they're holier-than-thou people? They did this and they did that. These people did it, and they did it in the right way mm-hmm. because they needed to confront ungodly leadership. That's what we need to do. If we will do that more and more and pray in the process, you just don't do it lightly. More and more churches will, the congregants will leave. More and more churches will close and the churches that are teaching the word of God will thrive and stay open. We've got to not fall into the Jeroboam. Jeroboam was the, uh, he was the political leader, but he also became the spiritual leader. And we've got to make sure and not follow people who do that. All right, let's move now to 1, Corinthians, or 1 Kings 13 because we're going to shift gears now. By the way, I will tell you, just because uh, this is on here, this is the chart that we're now going to be using a lot now that we're here. The, uh, it's a chart I've put together. It was a long time ago. I think it was, uh, anyway, several years ago. So I'm going to be going through looking at this and seeing if I missed some things or made any mistakes and correcting it if I do. But uh, if you find any mistakes, let me know too. But it's a, for me, it's a great chart. I love the charts that we get with our homework, but they're harder for me to understand. Uh, so you have the lineage of David over here in the southern kingdom, and you have the northern kingdom lineage here. What you'll find, which is interesting, is that there are eight good kings in red on this side. There are no good kings on this side. Jehu starts out good, but then he turns evil. Uh, you will see that these are all sons of their relatives, direct lineage, bloodline of David. These are different dynasties with different leaders. You have the s- southern kingdom called Judah, capital in Jerusalem. 
eventually defeated 586 B.C. by the Babylonians. Northern Kingdom is uh, called Israel. You've got all that on your information. We'll need to know that so we don't get confused as we go along. You'll see a little difference in names. Some of the names will be spelled differently in Chronicles and Kings. But in effect, this is what I think the names are in Kings as we go along. Well, we're going to shift gears now. All of a sudden, we just leave Jeroboam and Rehoboam. The civil war has started. The division came because of bad counsel. Now we're going to have a totally different story. In 1 Kings 13, who's this story about? Judah. It's about Judah. It's about somebody from Judah. But who's it, who's it about? People. A man of God and an old prophet. So we have two different people. Two religious leaders. All right. 1 Kings 13.1. Now behold, there, was, there came a man of God from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord while Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense. So all we know here is he's a man of God and he's coming up to confront Jeroboam. I wouldn't want to be in his shoes, but when you're called by God, you've got to do it. What did he do in verse 2? He, he cried out against the altar. So in effect, and he's going to prophesy. So he has the courage to come up and stand in front of the king, the king of the northern kingdom, even though he's in the south. Maybe he's a Levite who's going back. It doesn't say he's a man of God. Goes up, confront, courage to confront Jeroboam, and he prophesies. He says, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. That's the first part of the prophecy. Did it ever come true? We will read about it. 300 years later, it came true. We'll read about it in 2 Kings 23. And on you, he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you. Did that happen? We'll read about it. Number three, human bones shall be burned on you. Ugh, pretty, stu pretty tough. We'll read all about that. He comes up to the king and he prophesies something really negative. What he's saying, in effect, is what you're doing is wrong, and it's going to be destroyed later. N nobody knows at that time. It's going to be 300 years later, but it's going to be later. And then he gave a sign, verse 3. What was the sign? Okay, the altar will be split in part, uh, apart, and the ashes which are on it shall be poured out. What was uh, Jerob Jeroboam's response? Yeah, he stretched out his arm and said, Seize him! Yeah, as you can imagine, he's angry. His authority has been challenged. His religious authority has been challenged. So he stretched out and says, seize him. What happened to him? His hand was withered, drawn back to himself. So he couldn't do that. Verse 55, it says, the altar also was split apart and the ashes were poured out. So there was an immediate answer to the prophecy and then there was a future answer to the prophecy. We need to understand in Scripture that happens a lot with prophecies. Sometimes the same prophecy will be answered now, and then it will be answered again in the future. So that sign happened right there so everybody could see it. How did the king respond to that? He wanted to be healed. Okay, he wanted to be healed. So he says, please entreat whom? Lord God. The Lord your God. What does that tell you about him? It wasn't, his God. it wasn't his God. And pray for me that my hand may be restored. So the man of God entreated the Lord, and the Lord's hand, and the king's hand was restored to him, and it became as it was before. Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I'm going to give you reward. Hmm, I'd be a little suspect there. Is he going to give him reward because he heal, his hand was healed? Or is he going to kill him because he had the audacity to stand up against him? Who knows? But what did the man of God respond? No, no. no I can't go with you. It says, if you were to give me half your, your house, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. Why? Verse 9. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, nor drink water, nor return by way, nor return by the way which you came. So he went out another way and didn't return by the way he had gone to Bethel. Now that's interesting in itself because 
there weren't a lot of roads to go up to Bethel from Jerusalem. You had the main road. So he went some side road that was not well-known or well-traveled. Keep that in mind as we go forth. So what do you learn about this man of God? He was what? He feared the Lord here. Okay, he feared the Lord? Yeah, initially. Okay, he feared the Lord, and he, he obeyed. He was courageous because he went up before the king. We learned uh, he obeyed later. He obeyed uh, coming and going, you might say, when he came to the king and when he left the king. So we see him doing that. What else do we see about him? Well, he prophesied. Okay. So what would you say overall about this man of God from what you see here so far? Brave. Brave. He's brave to do the things he did. This man, to me, had a calling from God. He went to a very difficult, almost impossible environment to fulfill the calling of God. And then he continued to obey afterwards. Kind of reminds me of Jonah. Now, not the first part of Jonah, when he ran away, but Jonah, when he decided to obey God, where he obeyed. He maybe didn't want to, clearly didn't want to, but he did obey, and he did go through, and God honored that obedience. He was being protected by God, absolutely, because he could have been killed by Jeroboam. Even though his hand was withered, and even after he, uh, his hand was healed, God protected him from Jeroboam. So uh, we see really a person that I would like to follow and what I see from him here. He had a good heart in obedience to God. But something changed. Verse 11, who shows up on the scene? The old prophet, who was living in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the deeds which the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken to the king, these also they related to their father. Their father said, which way did he go, George? Which way did he go? <laughs> so his son has seen the way which the man of God had gone. And the old prophet said, that saddle up my donkey, and he went to catch the man of God. So it says in verse um, 15, the old prophet said to him, what? Come home with me. Okay, well, let's finish this up for and then try and figure it out. Verse 16, I cannot return with you, nor go with you, nor will I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. For a command came to me by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat or drink, and you know what the command is. So here he is, he's gone a different way, but the son saw it. He's, the old prophet has come up to him. He said the same thing. I'm going to stand on the word of God. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. Then in verse 18, the old prophet said, I also am a prophet like you. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. He did what? lied to him that's what the scripture says he lied to him so it wasn't just this maybe it really happened an angel of the lord did speak to him he out and out lied why would a prophet of the lord do such a thing well it might be because he's not from the house of levi or maybe he's a straggler of the house of levi that's still living up there we don't know that for sure Right, but a prophet doesn't also have to be a Levite. He can be a man of God that isn't a Levite. But didn't it almost say all the followers, all who, who wanted to serve the Lord? Followed right, the yeah, good point. All who wanted to serve the Lord followed Rehoboam to Jerusalem, but this guy didn't. So here we have this guy who has chosen to remain in that area where sinful things are happening. He's following a compromised conscience, and he's trying to justify his actions. Oh, boy, folks, that is so important. I can't tell you the number of people I know or I've run into over my years of working at pro-life who have become pro-abortion because they had an abortion, or their daughter had an abortion, or a friend had an abortion, and they have to justify that abortion is right because their friend or family or themselves had it, so they have to stand for abortion to justify that it's right. See, we'll do stupid things 
I'm not supposed to stay stupid, my granddaughter tells me. <laughs> we'll do really, we'll make really poor decisions, um, really poor decisions when we start justifying our actions. Isn't it Satan? Satan's always behind everything. I mean, ultimately, because it's a sinful world and he's in charge of this world. So his temptations are always there. His, his um, complacency for us is always there. I mean, he, or, or, or maybe, maybe. Uh, you know, I always like to give the person the benefit of that. Maybe this old prophet is lonely and he wants to have some good uh, Jewish conversation with another man of God. Maybe. Except that if that's the case, why would you lie about it? Well, you're right. It does say old prophet. It doesn't say prophet of God. Not in this category right here. I guess I'm making an assumption. I always look around to uh, um, my friend over there when I say assumption because sometimes we do. But I I'm assuming he's a man of God because it calls him a prophet. But maybe he's not. Maybe he's a prophet, but there are also false prophets. So it could be. Yeah, yeah. The, the man of God clearly seemed to be directed by God. It's the old prophet that one questions as to whether he was from God or not. So um, a as we look to Jeremiah 23, very fabulous, fascinating passage on false prophets, but I'm just going to read a few verses. Verse 16, thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. They are leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not the mouth of the Lord. So not every prophet, folks, is speaking the word of God. Continue on. Look at verses 25 to 27. Jeremiah 23. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsely in my name, saying, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long? Skip verse 26. 27 says, They intended to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which they relate to one another, just as their fathers forgot my name because of Baal. We've got to be careful when people come up to us and say, God told me that you're supposed to do this. Yeah, very much could have thought it was legitimate because he mixed, you know, the, well, as she said, let's read it before we go on. Um, keep your finger in Jeremiah 23 because I'm coming back. But in 1 Kings 13, verse 20, it says, Now it came about as they were sitting at the table, whoops, excuse me, verse 19. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. So he went back, he disobeyed. Now while they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah saying, thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the commandment of the Lord and have not observed the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you, but have returned and eaten bread and drank wine in the place and when you were not supposed to eat bread or drink water, your body shall come to the grave of your fathers. Uh, um, grave of your... Your body, your body shall not come to the grave of your fathers. Thank you. So here we have the old man lying, the old prophet lying, and now he's got a word from the Lord. It's tough. Let's go back to Jeremiah 23, verse 31. Behold, I am against the prophets, declares the Lord, who use their tongues and declare, the Lord declares, the Lord says this. And finally, verse 36, and the whole chapter is really good to read, but verse 36 says, for you will no longer remember the oracle of the Lord because every man's own word will become the oracle. Oh, that stings. And you have perverted the words of the living God, the Lord of hosts, our God. What happens is we think that God's speaking through, some of us think that God's speaking through us to other people. And we go to them with the authority of God when in fact it's our own words. I mean, I had somebody come up to me one time and tell me that because I didn't use the King James Version of the Bible and because I didn't preach the, tri tri -tri the post-tribulation rapture instead of the pre-tribulation rapture, I and my ministry were going to be damned and he threw a burnt disc down on the table. Mm. Well, uh, just to back up, about three months before that, he had come to me the first time I ever met him and said, I have a word from the Lord from you. And that was that I need to preach the King James and to uh, preach the post-tribulation rapture. That was the first thing he said. And then the next thing he did was that. Well, I prayed in between and sought God's direction in it. So I knew what God was telling me to do. But what happens when somebody comes to you and says, 
you need to do this, or the Lord has told me you need to do this, or the Lord has told me that you're supposed to do this. What is your response? Hmm? Yeah. I mean, if God wants you to do something, folks, he's going to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the old guy may have been hungry, and he, who knows what he wanted. You know, Ellen came to me one time. I had been on the radio years ago, and then went off of it, and she came to me and said, did the Lord speak to you at this conference? And I said, no, he said, she said, well, he spoke to me and he told me you're supposed to be back on the radio. <laughs> and, you know, you got to know Ellen to know Ellen doesn't just, you know, the Lord told me this kind of a thing. That's not the kind of person she is. So I, because it was Ellen, I said, okay, you know what? I'll pray about it. And then I went back to her and I said, God has given me the peace to move forward, but he's got to do this and this and this and this and this. And he did. <laughs> but would I have even thought about praying about it if she hadn't come to me? Uh, it wasn't on my radar to pray about. But she came to me, we prayed about it, and I think it took six months or a year, and it, it happened. So when somebody comes to me, I don't automatically dismiss them. But if God wants me to do it, he's got to show me. And it's got to be clear from him to me, and I listen to counsel. That's one of the things. But don't just jump to the decision and disobey God, what he's told you, without him changing, showing you anything different, and go because somebody else told you to. That's right. You don't know. Well, we are way out of time. So let me just finish by saying, verse 26. Now, when the prophet who brought him back from the way heard that he'd been killed because he was killed by the lion, uh, though isn't it interesting, the lion sat there, as did the donkey, and they didn't eat the body. And when he found out it's the man of God who disobeyed him, he went and he got, he saddled up the donkey and he went and he got him and he came back and he laid, laid him in his own grave. And he said in verse 31 of 1 Kings 13, when I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones, for the thing sure, shall surely come to pass, which he cried by the words of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places. So we learn there that it, it is going to come true. And then we find out in the next couple verses that Jeroboam did, re, did not return from the evil way of making, uh, but again made priests of the high places. Verse 34, the event became sin in the house of Jeroboam, and blotted it out and destroyed it from off the face of the earth. So we go back to Jeroboam's sin there. But what we see is that this man of God, he turned from God. I mean, but he listened to wrong, ungodly counsel. <laughs> counsel that was different than God had shown him. And because of that, what was the final consequence for him? Yeah. He was killed. Folks, if God has shown you something, do not turn away from it unless God is the one that shows you that he, it's time to move in a different direction and then make sure it's God. So we have a choice today, listening to counsel. What kind of counsel are we going to listen to? Bad counsel caused a civil war in Israel. Bad counsel caused a good man to go in the wrong direction and then uh, to go against God and ultimately to be killed. We talked earlier, good counsel can light, lead us in godly ways. There's so many good verses about that, but let me just read um, Proverbs, Psalm 119.24. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Let the word of God, let the voice of God be your counselor. Use wisdom from counsel of godly people who have God's interest in mind more than yours. But it's God that you listen to. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we seek counsel all the time. But do we listen to people who tell us what we want to hear? Or do we listen to people who speak the truth from the word of God, who give us biblical, scriptural guidance? God, I want to follow you. And I pray that everyone in this room wants to follow you so that we will always seek first your kingdom and righteousness. We will always seek godly counsel. And we will look for an answer from you, a confirmation from you, before we make decisions that would go or take us in an opposite direction. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. To contact Debbie Blank, you may do so at livingwordministry.org. That's www.livingwordministry.org. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.